Good evening, all, and welcome. Uh, in case you don't know me, my name is Igor Marjanovic, and I have a great honor to serve as the William Ward Watkin Dean of the uh, Rice School of Architecture. It is my great pleasure today, on behalf of the school and on behalf of our public programs and outreach arm, Rice Design Alliance, to welcome you to one of our signature events, uh, the Fall uh, Civic Forum, entitled Texas is Urban. RDA started in 1972 as, again, a community engagement arm of the school. It was began by our first dean, David Crane, who, together with some of our faculty members, was looking for new ways of community engagement, public advocacy, and in particular for ways for architecture to play a bigger role in political, social, and cultural debates, both uh, in the city of Houston and more broadly. And of course, we can only testify that 50 years on, we all know that we need more advocacy on all of those arenas, uh, including, including politics and architecture. Uh, considering the complexity of the issues that we are facing today in Houston and in Texas, I think the Civic Forum in particular is a, is a strong platform for us to have those conversations in part because one of the early ideas of the Civic Forum was to bring diverse voices to the table. That in addition of architects, we can also engage planners, historians, and civic leaders to have a more productive and also a larger uh, conversation. The very first event, a uh, public event that RDA organized was a civic forum in 1973, which was on the Buffalo Bayou uh, and how the landscape of the Buffalo Bayou could be reimagined as a new public space uh, of the city. Uh, before we talk more about the Civic Forum today and before I introduce uh, Troy Schaum, I just want to say that I'm really grateful uh, to all of the RDA members, the RDA board members and enthusiasts who have supported the organization uh, over a long period of time and who are supporting these kinds of events today. We are grateful uh, for your participation and we are also particularly grateful uh, to the staff of the School of Architecture and the Rice Design Alliance uh, who put up this event for us and who organized uh, both the logistics and the content for us today, um, and also the other RDA events, including the uh, RDA celebration that just took place uh, a few weeks ago. I'm also very grateful to Associate Professor Troy Schaum, uh, who has taken a very honorable role this year, which is to coordinate and direct the programs of RDA, uh, including the, our, our umbrella team, uh, Texas is Urban. So without much more ado, please join me in welcoming Associate Professor Troy Schaum. Thank you, Igor, and uh, thank you all for coming out tonight uh, for what I think is going to be a pretty exciting event. Um, uh, hopefully it uh, keeps up with our um, uh, celebration we had a few weeks ago, as Igor mentioned. Um, I wanted to um, also make sure I thank um, the staff that's uh, put all the work into coordinating this event um, behind the scenes uh, uh, and, and helping coordinate the travel of our guests and, and makes this um, project possible. And also, um, a, a kind of... Um, uh, uh, advisor and mentor in the room, uh, Stephen Fox, who uh, helped coordinate this particular event and I think uh, has uh, various connections and, um, and uh, liaisons with the, um, uh, many of the members that are uh, here on the panel tonight. So um, <coughs> this year, uh, as Igor mentioned, and everyone um, hopefully is finding out if they didn't know yet, um, Rice Design Alliance is celebrating uh, 50 years of looking closely at the built environment of Houston. And uh, in my contention is, by extension, the phenomena that is the Texas city. Next. Um, it, has, it has through programming, advocacy, documentation, dissemination, um, conversation, and finally, last but not least, of course, celebration, um, through its uh, 50 years, looked at the phenomena of Texas, uh, the Texas, Texas urbanism. Um, so in celebrating the 50th year of RDA, and of course, Next, <laughs> the 40th year of site. <laughs> um, uh, um, we, we thought we would zoom out and explore and interrogate the claim that I believe motivated the organization, organization's founding and continues to propel its members and its mission. Simply that, Texas is urban. As our program uh, poster advertises, the knowledge that Texas is urban is as much a collective uh, the, the, the knowledge that Texas is much a collective urban endeavor as an iconic image uh, of American conquest is easily established through questions of scale, impact, complexity, and diversity. However, the definition and shape of the Texas urban is an elusive phenomenon when we encounter it in the wild. I want to give a couple examples of the methods that I thought um, 
could reflect on how we might interrogate this problem over the course of the year. And in figuring out how to uh, introduce this group uh, and introduce some of the methodology, I thought about um, a visit I had a couple weeks ago from a couple of artists from France uh, that I was asked to tour around the city. And many of you have probably had this problem. Um, they showed up and they asked, where is the city? We want to see Houston. Where is uh, uh, um, the city um, in Texas? And, um, and you know, they, they, wh where can they walk down the street and see it? And so I thought of a couple of artifacts, and um, I'm, I'm the, uh, definitely the non-historian on the stage today, and so I, th I thought of these couple um, of design artifacts that we could think about uh, as both uh, objects and artifacts, but also as kind of methodologies for exploration. Next. The first, um, I thought, was a visit to the cistern at Buffalo Bayou. Um, it's embedded between our future and our past, a spectacular treasure of lost infrastructure with echoes of Sultan Ahmed in Istanbul. It stands as a reflection on our condition made through excavation of something lost and broken under our feet in the foundations of the city that once on earth became a vessel for expressing and knowing ourselves uh, in, the, in the contemporary age. In keeping with the legacy of the RDA Civic Forums, many of the Civic Forums and some of the talks today will look into this kind of unearthing. Next. The other site um, I wanted to take them to um, was to emerge above the treetops, to somehow see the city, um, uh, if not more clearly, at least more completely, uh, in the Chase Bank Tower. This is a panoramic vision that matches much of what our theme this year is attempting to capture, a zoom out, a kind of broad look uh, a stock taking uh, of our status as um, inhabitants of the Texas city. Looking simultaneously across history and culture while reflecting deeply on the built environment that makes us and these places that we work in thrive. The panoramic lens from the tower has been explored often by urban scholars from our own Lars Larep in his uh, vision of the zoomorphic canopy um, that you can see here uh, to Adrian Brown's black skyscraper. Um, <clears throat> and so I want to finish my introduction with a quote um, that's in the spirit of our exploration from Michel de Certeau, the, um, uh, who's writing on the practice of everyday life, um, it speaks of the kind of liberation in reading the city from the 110th floor of the World Trade Center, and I think captures a bit of the dizzying possibilities in our perspective in this year's reflection, on on reflection and celebration. And speaking of another city that I'm not gonna name uh, purposely uh, from, this, from this vantage, um, he says the city has uh, never learned the art of growing old by playing on its past. It presents an, it, its present invents itself from hour to hour in the act of throwing away its previous accomplishments and challenging the future. A city of proximal places and monumental reliefs. A spectator can read it, uh, can read in it a universe that is constantly exploding. So tonight, um, we have four amazing speakers um, uh, who are going to speak in succession, uh, and I'm going to give the introductions now, um, and then we'll have a conversation um, uh, to wrap up uh, the work in the end. We have Catherine Holliday, who is a professor and director of the Dillon Center for Texas Architecture at the University of Texan, Texas um, Arlington. Catherine is a professor of architectural and landscape history at the university in Dallas-Fort Worth, and is a founding director of the Dillon Center which connects the university to local communities and nonprofits. Her work focuses on the varied ways labor, architects, and critics, city governments, and corporations shape the built environment in American cities. Her most recent book is The Open-Ended City, David Dillon on Texas Architecture from the University of Texas Press. She is currently a Mellon Fellow in Urban Landscapes and Studies at the Dunbarton Oaks in Washington, DC, and holds a PhD in architecture and an MA in art and art history from the University of Texas at Austin. Um, Michael Kubo, uh, is an assistant professor uh, and program coordinator of architectural history and theory at the Gerald Hines uh, College of Architecture and Design at the University of Houston. His recent co-authored publications on the history of the 20th century architecture and urbanism include uh, Futures of the Architectural Exhibition, uh, Im Imagining the Modern Architecture and Urbanism of the Pittsburgh Renaissance, Heroic Concrete Architecture in the New Boston, and Off Office US Atlas. Jeffrey Lieber is an associate professor of art history at Texas State University and author of Flintstone Modernism or Crisis, of, Crisis in Post-War American Culture. In 2018, New York Time, he wrote a New York Times op-ed uh, titled, What Do We Lose uh, When the Union Car Carbide Buildings Fail? Sparked, and it sparked a debate about the meaning of the 20th century, uh, uh, the meaning of mid-20th century architecture uh, 
in the US uh, uh, context. Lieber's essays and reviews have appeared in such journals as Architectural Histories, Texas Architect, Harvard Design Magazine, and Design and Culture. Um, he has received his uh, uh, AB from Vassar College and his PhD from the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Raul Ramos is an associate professor of history at the University of Houston with expertise in uh, borderlands history, Mexican American history, and the history of the American West in, and in Texas. He has received his AB from Princeton University and his PhD from Yale University. Um, he's also taught at the uh, University of Utah and held the um, Summerfield Roberts Fellowship at the Clement Center for Southwestern Studies at Southern Methodist University. He is the author of Beyond the Alamo, Foraging Mexican Ethnicity in San Antonio, uh, 1821 to 1861, published by the University of North Carolina Press. Um, so with that, I would like to welcome our speakers and we'll, we'll start with uh, uh, Catherine Holliday. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Troy. Um, and I, I do want to say thank you to Troy, thank you to Carla for um, making things so easy. Um, and, and especially thank you to every, well, the, everyone who had the vision to create the RDA uh, across the past 50 years and to keep it going. Houston is incredibly fortunate to have provided a model that I think those of us in other Texas cities like Dallas, Fort Worth, um, really envy. Uh, and it's, you know, congratulations on 50 years and, and the anniversary. Um, can I have the next slide? Um, I am here today to talk a little bit about Dallas-Fort Worth and maybe to just ask a few questions um, because I am thinking uh, especially about urban landscapes um, quite a bit recently. I'm going to think in that scale and especially thinking about the relationship of the Trinity River in North Texas to the making of Dallas-Fort Worth um, as a region and, and as an urban region. Um, can I have the next slide, please? All right. So in 1925, the Fort Worth Sand and Gravel Company purchased an advertisement in the local newspaper, the Star-Telegram, celebrating the completion of the new Fort Worth Club building. It was handsome, if conservative, tall building, and today still houses the club where city makers and civic boosters gather for lunch, dinner, and drinks to hatch civic plans. The idea of the private city club that exists outside of outwardly democratic and public civic institutions is one that is well established in Texas cities and this advertisement pairing a construction firm with this civic elite is relatively generic example of this kind of civic boosterism that architecture and materials firms of course still engage in. Calling attention to both their products and their projects through a kind of benevolent self-promotion. The next slide. For me though, these advertisements for the sand and gravel company have become more interesting as I've spent the past several years looking at histories of the Trinity River and the Dallas-Fort Worth region and the people and places that inhabited its riverbanks. The source for the sand, gravel, and cement that made the Fort Worth Club and countless other buildings, bridges, roads, and highways was in fact the Trinity River itself, which has its headwaters in the forks to the west and north of Fort Worth before meandering through Dallas and then several hundred miles through East Texas to pour into the Gulf of Mexico. Next slide, please. The Fort Worth Sand and Gravel Company, um, which traces its roots to the late 19th century and formally named around 1910 or so, owned dozens of gravel pits like this one along the banks of the river where it dug enormous deep holes that were essentially strip mines to supply the concrete that would make the cities of Dallas, Fort Worth and all of the cities in between. These cities are quite literally made from the river, mining its sandy banks and deposits of Frio clay to pave the prairie. Next slide. So much of the conversation about modern Texas architecture is based in its materiality. Um, David Williams um, and O'Neill Ford studied romanticism about the Texas frontier and its white settlers, the limestone houses of the Texas hill country, the soft Mexican brick that Ford especially loved, um, these have all fueled generations of Texas architects to consider what an authentic Texan architecture should be. But when we consider processes of urbanization or the idea that Texas is urban, um, rather than a landscape dotted with pristine cabins, we're asked to consider materiality on a much larger scale. How did we build the cities of Texas? Because it was definitely not one uh, limestone block or one hand-cut brick at a time. 
What are the systems, resources, and labor that fuel the 20th century growth of cities in this state? Uh, and obviously there are a lot of different answers to these questions. Um, and today I just wanna suggest that linking histories of architecture to environmental histories of materials and regions is crucial for a reconsideration of urbanism in Texas. The next slide, please. Uh, so many stories of cities in Texas still indulge in the myth-making narratives of early developers and civic boosters, and I'm showing you Fort Worth's current advertisement ad campaign, they did not ask me about this, um, which is, welcome to Fort Worth, discover the modern West, which to me looks just like 1925 with our judge the future by the past, uh, with our cowboy looking off into the horizon. Um, that, you know, this, this kind of pinning ourselves to these past stereotypes, make critical examinations in the next slide here too, um, of scales and systems at the urban landscape scale, um, very difficult and they're very much needed. And, and Dallas's perennial claims to just bigness um, is something that has been around for a very, very long time and is quite persistent. Um, cities in Texas have received far less scholarly attention than at other parts of the country. Um, in his recent review of Texas urban histories, my um, recently retired colleague at UT Arlington, Robert Fairbanks, um, an urban historian who, who writes especially about housing uh, and planning history, um, noted that in the 1980s there were no urban histories on Texas cities. And today we're really just starting to catch up. This is a pretty curious lack of scholarly attention and um, Bob ascribed it to uh, a fascination with the rural, the kind of frontier history of the state, which we can certainly see in David Williams and O'Neill Ford's focus and architecture. It's also true that working on Texas is still viewed in many circles as provincial, and academics in Texas have often avoided working on projects that would further marginalize themselves. Uh, and this is one of the great benefits of something like the RDA, which provides support and encouragement for studies of Houston um, and creates a really rich discourse. Next slide, please. <coughs> so today, I'd like to focus my remaining observations on, on Fort Worth and Dallas um, and view through the scale of the Trinity, which unites the urban landscape of these two twin cities. There's been almost nothing written about the pairing of these two large cities or how their physical, social, and economic systems fit together, and certainly not from an architecture, landscape, and urbanism perspective. Now that Fort Worth is the 13th largest city in the country, or the 12th, depending on how you count, and as our city leaders remind us over and over and over again, um, it's even more puzzling um, as an oversight. And the next slide, please. Um, I will suggest that the Trinity River, um, which you're looking at here uh, just south of downtown Dallas, uh, well on its way to the Gulf, provides a means of asking new questions about the city's urban landscape and architectural histories that can help us understand Texas, both the myth and the reality, just a little bit better. So to do that, I'm trying to work at multiple scales. Um, and I should say this is a work in progress, and it's really important um, as I pursue this project um, for historians and practitioners to work together. I think that's a really critical piece of this. Um, and I'm working with colleagues who are in the middle of researching and writing, using my traditional historian's tools, um, especially archive, and an archival materials, as well as working with community members who can tell their own stories and share them with us and share family histories and linking that to environmental and labor history and linking again to urban and architectural history, making things more complicated. Next slide, please. The Trinity watershed is defined by the region mark number eight on this map over there, kind of in the top right corner. Um, and as someone who grew up in New Orleans on the Mississippi River, I have to say Texas rivers often feel relatively minor to me. Um, and this one uh, was largely unnavigable uh, by large boats for most of its length. This is incredibly frustrating to civic boosters who spent decades, um, really up through the 1980s, trying to make plans to change the course of the river to accommodate uh, the scale of shipping that would make it an economic engine from the Gulf all the way up to Dallas and, and Fort Worth. But despite that shortcoming, the, the river has always been vital. Um, it's always been inhabited, um, first by Native Americans who used the river landscape for fishing and foraging, 
And next, uh, next slide, please. Um, by African Americans brought to Texas as enslaved people to work the cotton fields on the far western edge of the southern plantation landscape. Um, from the Miller Plantation in southern Dallas, and I'm showing you um, a scrapbook uh, from the Miller Plantation on um, this side of the screen. Um, to the Carruth Plantation in northern Dallas, um, to the Jones Plantation in present-day Grapevine, to the Cheney Plantation east of Fort Worth. All of these cotton plantations depended on the Trinity River and its watershed, and all of these plantations established a spatial order that placed the homes of enslaved black people along the floodplains of the banks of the creeks and tributaries of the Trinity, um, as well as along the Trinity itself. During Reconstruction, those communities of black people attained ownership of those lands along the Trinity through various means and formed autonomous settlements with varied relationships to the farms and industries that continue to grow around them. Next slide, please. At exactly the same time, uh, railroads came to Texas by the 1870s and began to follow the flat topography along the edges of the river's floodplain to crisscross North Texas. To create the foundations for those railroad tracks, the first large-scale gravel pits were created directly adjacent to the tracks, literally digging out the riverbanks to create the raised level flood protected rail lines. Those new rail lines and their spurs made it possible to expand the scale of extraction by building spur lines directly to the gravel pits, creating a landscape of industrial scale extractions, mass long haul transportation, and small agricultural communities of formerly enslaved people and their descendants who worked the railroads, the gravel pits, and the land. Um, in the inset map here on the right, um, those competing land uses are hinted at along Bear Creek, um, along with Eagle For the Eagle Forge Shale's fingers extending its dendral-like fingers, and then a concrete spur of the Santa Fe Railroad curving southward to collect and redistribute the mined sand and gravel. In the next slide, please. A map like the one here, um, which is just a piece of Dallas County, uh, this is a map created by the Dallas Petroleum Geologists, uh, suggests the fundamental economic and geological integration of the city with the geological formations that supplied its materials. Um, and that small area in blue over there on the left is, is about the same area of the map that I showed you in the previous slide. Um, shale, chalk, clay, gravel, um, they exist almost without limit, um, according to a 1941 report. And as Dallas and Fort Worth's highways expanded, the areas shown in white on this map were strip mined to provide the materials of urban architecture and infrastructure. At the same time, this map leaves absent the presence of people and their role in the region's transformation from rural to urban. And next slide, please. Bear Creek, in addition to having the largest deposits of sand and loam in the area, was also the name for the largest black settlement in Dallas-Fort Worth. Its gravel pits employed Bear Creek residents well into the late 1960s when those supposedly limitless gravel pits began to shut down, leaving behind a landscape of landfills and abandoned deep holes that filled with water. New industrial development filled in the gaps between displacing residents and their farms and radically changing the community and its landscape. Um, it's probably a little hard to see, but uh, the inset maps on the right show you development of Bear Creek from 1930 to 1960 to 1922 um, from a small agricultural community, community with a few homes scattered throughout um, to in uh, 1960. You can see the outlines of all of those gravel pits to 2022, um, the transformation into a post-industrial landscape. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, over the, um, the process of this project, um, the, the questions that I am bringing, I think, to the conversation today have to do with uh, materiality, uh, processes of urbanization in Dallas-Fort Worth, and the ways that these interlinked environmental and labor, labor histories should ask us to reframe how we consider the role of building in shaping urban Texas. This small freedmen's community of Garden of Eden east of Fort Worth, physically supplied the sand and gravel to build downtown um, in that Fort Worth club that we started out with. 
Um, and the men who lived there worked for the Fort Worth Sand and Gravel Company. There is a large-scale system at play in the urbanization of Texas that needs to acknowledge these complexities and the multiscalar systems that benefited some during urbanization and left others to bear the burdens of its harms and waste. Uh, next slide, please. Over the past uh, six months, a year or so, I've been working with a colleague at UT Arlington, Amanda Amund, who is an architect who uses mapping as a means of storytelling about cultural links to place. Um, using the archival approach that is my specialty and her own techniques of digital collaging, we've created several maps that attempt to link these interconnected pieces of the story of the land, people, and processes that created the city of Dallas-Fort Worth from the river. Like Bear Creek, Garden of Eden's gravel pits have become open, deep lakes and landfills. Um, and this is 1960 on the left and 2022 on the right. Um, and this, I, I would really emphasize, this is not the same story that we tell about urbanization that, that's the story of sprawl, where the city just overtakes the land um, in this kind of rapid pace. Instead, you're literally um, building the city out of the earth itself. And this pattern is repeated over and over along the river from Fort Worth to Dallas. Can I have the next slide, please? Um, I won't go into each of these, but as, as we map individual communities and map the gravel pits, map the sites of extraction, map the, the landfills, this is, this is what has redefined the river and made the city. Uh, and next slide, please. So if this is not a typical story of sprawl, it's also not the same story told by current narratives of the river, uh, where efforts toward flood control and navigation dominate stories of the river's shape. Um, and stories about the river will become even more urgent um, as flooding intensifies in Dallas with increased urban development in far west Fort Worth along the origins um, of the Trinity River. Instead, um, I suggest we should really see urbanization in Dallas-Fort Worth as a process of extractive mining and labor that transforms material flows of the river landscape into a city of concrete, as you see um, in the city of Dallas behind me, um, with that constrained Trinity River as a straight line to the right-hand side of the screen, and this really kind of beautiful parallel run uh, by the highway um, directly to, to its east. Thank you. Okay. So this is um, this is kind of going to be a personal bibliography story in some way. So I, 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 as I've said to some of you, uh, the caveat up front is that I'm going to be talking, at least certainly in the first part of this, about a lot of things with which those of you especially associated with Rice will be exceedingly familiar. And so I beg your forgiveness uh, kind of in advance. Um, next slide. <clears throat> so part one. So this is a personal story of two arrivals, or rather of one arrival told in two very different ways in terms of my thinking. Uh, next slide, please. Actually, previous slide. <laughs> well, interesting. Maybe it doesn't want to do it. Uh, when I first came to Houston five years ago, I took for granted that Texas was urban, I think, uh, or at least that the aspects of the built environment that seemed to me the most urgent to explore were those defined by the urban phenomena, the urban dynamics of places like Houston, and I think this sense is supported if you look uh, at sources like the Texas historian David McComb, uh, whose book The City in Texas confirms that by 2015, just you know, a couple of years before I moved here, 88% uh, of Texans lived in cities, however defined, in some form or another. Uh, next slide, please. In particular, I came fortified, I think in advance, by a rich body of writing uh, from the 1970s to the 2000s that placed Houston as a radical testing ground for new ways of understanding the relentless permutations of late 20th century urbanism uh, writ large. This work was typically framed around Houston's extreme scale as well as its exacerbated phenomena of development, uh, dissipation, fragmentation, and juxtaposition of urban forms and types and uses within this 
sprawling landscape, uh, famously enabled, of course, by its lack of zoning. Next slide, uh, please. Uh, chief among these attempts to formulate broader theories of urbanism out of Houston-specific conditions, for me as, of course, for so many others, and here is especially the part that everyone at Rice will know to the point of exhaustion, uh, is, of course, Lars Lerup already invoked uh, his formulation of Houston as representing the metropolis that comes after the traditional city, uh, a metastasizing horizontal field of events and affects punctuated by moments of action and dissipation, or of stim and dross in his new uh, terminology. Next slide. Uh, Larup's work gave a series of evocative, uh, certainly for me, evocative new terms through which to navigate the strata of this still new to me urban landscape and its constituent elements, uh, some of which have already been mentioned, from the mega shape to the zuhima canopy. I mean, these terms were, were you know, quite formative for me. Uh, next slide. And this work continued through, of course, later books like this one with its analysis of the phenomenology of time, distance, and space uh, within this condition of one million acres and no zoning. Next slide. Uh, others at or in the orbit of Rice uh, in these years were also, of course, key players in this developing body of urban theory, particularly Albert Pope, uh, also quite well known, of course, to everybody here in his seminal book, Ladders, with its analysis of the traditional gridded city versus the spines that characterize the majority of Houston's surface, formerly classified as suburban, uh, a problematic term, but now really the fundamental structuring tissue of the very urban itself. Next slide. Um, let's see, I'm fine. Uh, next slide, please. Thanks. Above all for me in these pre-Houston years, I think was Rem Koolhaas' conversations with students at Rice of 1996, two years after Larup's uh, Stim and Dross, and the same year as Pope's Ladders. So this very slender volume became a real touchstone for me as a student originally in his description of Houston as uh, sort of an extreme ideological expression of other possible forms of coherence that he was searching for beyond uh, what he calls the glue of traditional urban form. Next slide. Uh, on the ground in Houston, I found other pieces of this tradition from the rich archive of, of writing in Sight Magazine, you know, pr prime uh, product of the RDA, uh, on the city over the previous 40 years, uh, only a small portion of which is compiled in this book, Ephemeral City. Uh, next slide. To earlier roots of interest in Houston as a laboratory for studying broader urban phenomena of the contemporary American city, uh, none more so, uh, perhaps, than the studio taught by Robert Venturi and Denise Scott Brown uh, it, with uh, Doss Mabe and Peter Papadimitriou uh, as guest critics at Rice in 1969 that studied Westheimer as an urban corridor uh, one year after their far more famous Las Vegas studio and, uh, I should say, two years before the publication of the epical Learning from Las Vegas. Here, learning from Houston's commercial strip instead, Venturi and Scott Brown proposed an evolution of their Vegas studio method uh, via a control game where students were split uh, in the studio into two teams, one uh, as urban designer to create a series of rules or controls for development along Westheimer, the other as entrepreneur tasked with subverting these rules to their own uh, economic interests. And then they would kind of rerun the exercise over and over again. Uh, and here I wanna thank uh, not just Troy, but uh, also Danny Samuels for uh, directing me to people like Robert Heineman who had a lot of these documents and were willing to send them uh, to me uh, as a participant in the studio in 1969. Uh, next slide. The insights gained from Houston uh, that they gained from Houston manifested a year later in Venturi and Scott Brown's exhibition on the highway at the ICA in Philadelphia, in which they astutely characterized the structural relationship between Houston's fragmented and hostile auto environment and the particular housing types that emerged here to provide a sense of identity and protection against incompatible land uses provided elsewhere by zoning. So this kind of symbiotic relationship between the one and the other. Uh, next slide, please. Two years later, the AIA Guide to Houston, which I love this book, I think from 1972, uh, produced for uh, the organization's national convention held here in the same year, uh, reflected, I think, this Venturi and Scott Brownian view of Houston, uh, partly in its cover, which is drawn graphically out of the communicative wordscape of the Houston freeway system, very much like a Venturi Scott Brown kind of drawing of the Las Vegas Strip, uh, but also in its interior illustrations, which combined 
uh, Vegas Strip-esque views from the road with the symbolic landscape of the housing types that were umbilically attached to this road system. Uh, next slide. Other discoveries in this lineage reflected what uh, Joel Warren Barna uh, described as a long American tradition of minority reports uh, in which the social, political, economic, and psychological dimensions of architecture and urbanism were probed as they played out in Houston's horizontal field. Uh, for Doug Milburn, Houston was the last American city characterized, so characterized by its ever unfinished status as process rather than as product, while for Barna, the boom and bust of Houston's oil, real estate, and finance economy offered a paradigmatic case of what he called the see-through years, which is an homage uh, to the abandoned development projects that littered the city's landscape after the 1980s, begun a decade too late, uh, almost, in terms of the oil boom. Uh, next slide. If there were common threads through this lineage of theorizations of Houston's urbanism, I would say uh, that, it, at least for me, it's that they all dealt above all with urban form with the changing morphology of the city and the spatial and architectural types that emerged amid a late capitalist condition that was both fragmented and dissipated. Type, pattern, formal structure, movement, and flow were key elements within this field of urban, urban events, from the ex-urban office park, uh, or the office building, to the residential suburb and everything in between. Uh, next slide. Arrival part two, next. Uh, next slide, please. We landed in Houston two weeks before the storm, and I don't have to tell anybody which storm that was. For newcomers to Texas like us, Hurricane Harvey provided a terrifying crash course in the geography and the hydrology of the city, its micro differences in topography, and its macro differences in equity and resources across the city's neighborhoods. So too, we were introduced to the city's a perverse combination of rampant development combined with existential dread, uh, and of the fundamental brokenness of both the city's infrastructures and its frameworks for understanding risk, among other things. Uh, for example, the heuristic measure of the so-called 500-year flood event that proved quite inadequate to the new reality in which these kinds of megastorms are henceforth going to be separated by years rather than by centuries. All of this suggested immediately upon arrival a need to seek out another set of sources for conceptualizing this sort of urbanism rather different from the lineage uh, that I've just described. Uh, next slide, please. Looking back, the specter of these other parallel theories of urbanism was perhaps already latent, uh, or not so latent, in the work of somebody like Larup with his invocation of the oceanic and of the weather as itself, both as a sensorium, but also as an actor that already for him wielded an outsized influence on the experience of the city. Next, please. Uh, I quickly gravitated to other sources that opened onto other channels of thought, other categories of thinking the city, uh, like Dominic Boyer and Mark Vardy's Hydraulic Houston with its proposition of concepts like amphibious futurism and hydraulic citizenship through which we might learn to navigate the social and political complexities of Houston's uh, present and of the next century. Next, please. These questions, I think, have been taken up with a particular power uh, in the very recent book, More City Than Water, edited by Lacey Johnson and Cheryl Beckett, which brings narrative cartography, really, really uh, interesting narrative cartography, and evocative storytelling to bear in creating a Houston flood atlas as another kind of map appropriate to a city in which many still today are struggling to deal with the ongoing effects of Harvey and other infrastructural disasters, the freeze and so on. Uh, next, please. The unequally distributed impacts of these flooding and freezing and other sorts of events repeatedly is linked, of course, to other maps, namely of redlining and restrictive covenants amid other policies of racial and ethnic segregation that also uh, fairly obviously needed to be more fully addressed in Houston's urban theorizations, or at least the ones that I had been uh, familiar with previously. Uh, next. Again, here I discovered another parallel body of work on Houston's urbanism uh, for myself that, that took up precisely these issues, originating in the very same period of Houston's 1970s boom and post-1980s uh, bust. Key among these uh, was Robert Bullard's Invisible Houston, uh, 
a history of the black experience in Houston in this period and which significantly, crucially detailed the environmental racism that was manifest in the placement of toxic industrial facilities, landfills, and waste sites that disproportionately bordered uh, Houston's black communities. This study formed a core of the work through which Bullard became one of the major figures in the rise of the environmental justice movement uh, in the US. Uh, next, please. Other sources were of a similar vintage, like James Blue's documentary films from the similarly titled Invisible City, a study of Houston's housing crisis during the booming oil economy of the uh, late 1970s, produced with uh, Adele Santos, who was at Harvard but was visiting at Rice uh, at the time. Next, please. Uh, or his 1978 film of the same year, Who Killed Fourth, uh, Fourth Ward, uh, an exceptional film which even more powerfully documents, uh, I think, the neglect and destruction of Houston's oldest uh, black community, uh, the Fourth Ward, uh, specifically to do with the planning and development of the um, uh, Allen Center uh, in this period. Next, please. So, of course, the other thing that uh, all of this linked into and was surrounding all of these issues uh, and kind of demanded attention to this other lineage is the petro economy, of course, uh, and the status of places like Houston Ship Channel and uh, specifically the problem of fence line communities along it uh, that also seem to be kind of shot through but in not all cases uh, substantially present in these kinds of history. Uh, next, next, please. <clears throat> and so this again, we could return maybe to Larup. And so Larup's definitions of Stim and Dross interestingly already kind of maybe suggest the opening points out onto this uh, accounting of you know, fl uh, off-gassing and flaring events and other sorts of things, uh, and of waste, the kind of uh, wastescape as the counterpart of this, right? So you could sort of start to read the bones of maybe a proto-environmental uh, consciousness out of this. Uh, next, please. And so this led me then to other things, like this also another kind of uh, somewhat underground uh, volume on the banks of uh, Bayou City, uh, which was produced by the Center for Land Use Interpretation, uh, Matthew Coolidge and others from uh, CLUE, uh while on residency for one year at the University of Houston in which they began to map uh, this territory along the bayou all the way through to the ship channel, uh, going out and kind of conducting exp uh, expeditions and then also introducing a series of what you see in the slide as um, what they called benchmarks, which were literally placing benches along it to create some visibility of this kind of infrastructure. Next, please. Uh, and this is also, in returning to something like more city than water, there are, of course, many layers of the narrative cartography that takes place in this book, including uh, maps of oil infrastructure and of toxic events, toxic events and flares and things. Uh, next slide, please. And so I should say here also uh, that it was particularly important for me in discovering you know, lineages of this work uh, that the CDRC, the Community Design Resource uh, Center at University of Houston led by Susan Rogers has, has been working on these issues of flooding, infrastructure, planning, and inequality for many years through all of this. Uh, next, please. Uh, all of these concerns have led to uh, some of my own more recent work, for example, in a collaborative project with Matt Johnson uh, titled Gulf uh, Ecology, Precarity, and Environmental Justice along the Gulf Coast and which is specifically going to be about studying uh, the impacts of all of this on fence line communities in particular uh, along the ship channel uh, and sort of more broadly along the Houston uh, Gulf Coast. Next, please. And so, you know, in wrapping up between part one and part two, you know, I'm sort of currently wondering whether there is some ground for synthesis. In other words, some space where all of these things can take their part in a contemporary theory of Houston urbanism that builds upon the old and then kind of layers in uh, the new. This is purely speculative, um, but that's kind of where I am at in my thinking. So thank you. Can you hear me? All right. In the summer of 2021, 
I was invited to join the State Board of Review of the Texas Historical Commission. This is the committee that evaluates sites in Texas nominated for inclusion in the National Register of Historic Places. As a lifelong New Yorker and recent Austin transplant, I was surprised but delighted to be asked to serve in this capacity. And it's been a fantastic crash course in the history of Texas architecture and urbanism. Tonight, I'd like to share with you one of my favorite proposals to come through the committee in the past year for the Tyler Downtown Historic District and to make some general comments about several buildings highlighted in the proposal. Having chronicled a handful of very bitter, high-profile preservation battles in New York, I was unsure what to expect in Texas, but I quickly realized how different the situation is here, and I now believe that the urban renewal and revitalization efforts, particularly in small cities, can serve as a model for other states. Next slide. One of the things that most surprised me is how beautifully modernist and brutalist buildings are integrated into historic downtown settings. Of the 135 sites included in the Tyler proposal, two immediately stood out for me. The Carlton Hotel from 1954 and the Federal Courthouse Annex from 1976. The Carlton Hotel was a product of the mid-century oil boom in East Texas. While other buildings in Tyler, like the People's Petroleum Building and the Bryant Petroleum Building, were developed by prominent businessmen, the hotel was spearheaded by the Chamber of Commerce and funded by 650 local citizen stockholders. Next slide. The building combines distinctive international style motifs with the flashy allure of Morris Lapidus's Miami Beach hotels. Two matchbook covers and a still photograph that I culled from the internet emphasize its key features. The cantilevered entry canopy, sculptural ribbon windows, and bossa nova inspired rooftop design. Yet, the Carlton's real significance for me is symbolic as part of a cultural narrative about Texas. Next slide. In my work, I make connections between architecture and film. And in this case, I couldn't help but think of Lucy Gallant, a 1955 Paramount film starring Jane Wyman and Charlton Heston. Wyman plays a socialite from New York who gets stranded in a Texas boomtown called New City. Next slide. Predictably, the local women awash in new oil money covet her clothes, Paris originals. So she sets up a pop-up shop and sells the contents of her suitcases. With $4,865 in profits and a loan from the local bank, she opens a store, Gallants Incorporated, specializing in exclusive clothes in good taste. Before long, the town is transformed, its people turned into swells. The film charts the town's rapid development. Lucy's first boutique is an Art Deco storefront on Main Street. Next slide. But it quickly expands to become a massive department store modeled on Neiman Marcus. In this way, the film conveys real truths about Texas as a site of innovation in department store development and fashion merchandising in the 1950s. Next slide. 
During the climactic sequence, a fashion show at Gallants, famed costume designer Edith Head appears as herself to explain that today, the real fashion center of the world is right here in Texas. Her obvious nod to Charles James's epoch-defining ball gowns had a real-life connection in Houston socialite Dominique de Menil's patronage of the designer. Next slide. Hardly cliche, the film cleverly toys with the meaning of gallantry and the metaphor of refinement. This is how Head describes the fashion show's finale. Here, in this magnificent gown, are all the iridescent colors of your own Texas oil. Crude resources and vulgar manners reach the apex of material effervescence and social polish. That's also the lesson of the Carlton Hotel, which was bankrolled by the local population and signaled the emergence of a modern vernacular mixing international style with Texas values. Next slide. On a side note, uh, the Lucy Gallant narrative still holds potent appeal uh, as demonstrated by Edmund White's 2020 novel, A Saint from Texas, about two sisters from East Texas in the 1950s who take divergent paths, one marrying into Parisian high society while the other becomes a Catholic nun. Next slide. Typical of swank hotels built in boom towns, the Carlton's business fell off by the late 1960s uh, with the flight to the suburbs and the construction of shopping malls. In 1971, it was sold to the county for use as offices. Often, the best thing that could happen to these buildings was to fall into municipal hands because they remained relatively intact due to lack of funds or will to make alterations. Abandoned in 2013, it became attractive to developers, and in 2021, it was purchased by North Companies, based in New Orleans, which plans to convert it into a mixed-use apartment complex designed by Fitzpatrick Architects, a Tyler-based firm. Next slide. The federal courthouse annex struck me as a wonderful and non-controversial example of municipal brutalism. Next slide. Inspired by Le Corbusier's late masterpieces, as well as Paul Rudolph's examples and Kalman, McKinnell, and Knowles' notorious Boston City Hall, it's one of several notable brutalist civic structures in Texas, including the now demolished Hattie Mae White Building in Houston from 1969, designed by Newhouse and Taylor, and Fort Worth's City Hall, which was one of Edward Durrell Stone's last projects to be completed. What frightens people about these buildings and leads to popular critiques that they are ugly, and ill-situated in their urban context is their inhuman scale more than their forms or materials. Next slide. The Tyler Annex is none of those things. In scale, siting, and design, it takes its cues from the adjoining New Deal era post office, whose entablature serves as a visual joinder to the Annex's cornice. The most prominent brutalist feature, the projecting vertical bands, mimic the post office's projecting pilasters and symmetrical window and bay system, while its soft painted surface blends with the post office's limestone facade. In essence, it's a brutalist interpretation of its neoclassical neighbor, uh, 
and it's marvelously successful and pleasing from every angle along the street. Next slide. Nearby the annex is the People's National Motor Bank from 1966, designed by E. Davis Wilcox, which was featured in the 1969 issue of Texas Architect. Wilcox was a Tyler native and is arguably a comparable figure to Rudolph or Stone, although he never achieved anywhere near the same level of national or international renown. He trained at a regional university, Georgia Tech, and spent a year at the Ecole des Beaux-Arts in Paris with additional graduate coursework at Yale. In 1946, after serving in the Navy, he returned to Tyler, where he designed dozens of buildings and became a leader of regional associations. His unorthodox Beaux-Arts approach to modernism resulted in eclectic but very elegant buildings. Next slide. I'd place the People's National Motor Bank in the same class as Rudolph's Sarasota High School, for example, and again, due to its smaller scale, uh, it may be even better. This is urbane architecture with a degree of sophistication that exceeds many iconic corporate modern buildings in major cities. Next slide. In Tyler, these buildings coexist harmoniously with Gothic Revival, Romanesque Revival, Art Deco, and other mid-century and late modern structures. The historic downtown may now be a ruin, but it was never subsumed by sprawl. As a result, it's a veritable theme park of late 19th and 20th century architecture. In many cases, downtown historic districts like Tyler have been designated as opportunity zones, and developers are taking advantage of the tax credits attached to buildings listed in the National Register. I was surprised on a recent tour of the Baker Hotel in Mineral Wells, which is undergoing a painstaking multi-million dollar restoration, to hear the developer pin his hopes for the project's success on social media. But apparently, thousands of people are following the project on Instagram. Handles such as Mod Texas are turning cities like Tyler into destination locales. Next slide. Yet the real influencers are the residents whose knowledge of these buildings and passion for the preservation and revitalization of their cities is remarkable. In 2018, Wilcox's Cooperative Savings and Loan Building from 1956 was featured in Tyler's This Place Matters campaign, an initiative inviting residents to leave heart bombs on the building's facade. This strangely neo-constructivist building was recently uh, for sale with plans drawn up by Fitzpatrick Architects for its conversion into lofts. A final thought. The efforts in Tyler, which acknowledge the architectural and social significance of historic buildings, but balanced with the need for adaptive reuse, offer an important alternative to the divisive, highly publicized campaigns that are still roiling cities like New York and Los Angeles. Thank you. Uh, good evening. My name is Raul Ramos. Um, 
I, I want to start with a um, uh, confession. I'm not a designer and I'm not a design critic. Uh, my milieu is narrative. I like to tell stories about the past, I like to read stories about the past, and I like to think about these stories. And uh, in particular, I'm interested in how these stories shape how we see the world around us today, how we see urban landscapes, and in the case of what I'll be talking about today, whether we consider those landscapes urban at all. Um, first slide. I want to uh, begin with uh, this idea of seeing and how we see, and in, in, in this case, how we see 200 years of uh, urbanism in Texas, in particular through San, San Antonio de Bejar, or Bejar as it was uh, simply called in um, the early 19th, late 18th, early 19th century. And in particular, I'm interested in both looking at the place, its history, and, and, um, and its organization, and, um, and then how that history and that, how that organization is essentially silenced or erased or forgotten or maybe put on a shelf in the past. Uh, next slide. Uh, first, as a matter of context, the, uh, the, the urban landscape of the Southwest, of what we now call the American Southwest, um, has deep roots, uh, historic roots, to, uh, based in the Spanish uh, colonial period. Many of many cities that we know of today uh, were founded by the Spanish, uh, by Sp Spanish colonial efforts, uh, which combined uh, both, or three efforts essentially, military efforts, uh, Catholic uh, priests through mission efforts, and, um, and civilian, and civilian uh, uh, um, projects. And in this case, that those civilian projects essentially are these towns or cities um, looking at, you know, going uh, across the, the, this, uh, Frontier, Frontera, we see uh, Santa Fe, for instance, founded in 1610, San Antonio de Bejar in 1718, uh, Los Angeles in, excuse me, Tucson in 1775, <clears throat> Los Angeles in 1781, and I should mention Isleta, or that is now El Paso in 1681. Next slide. In particular, I'm interested in, as I was saying, in, uh, in San Antonio, and uh, the time, the period I'm looking at in, in my own work, in my own research, is that uh, right at the, at the period of transition from Spanish colony to Mexican nation, so looking at the entrance of the nation state into San Antonio, um, which coincides with the period of American immigration, American uh, immigration into Mex northern Mexico, into, into Texas, uh, and the role that, that and, and the changes that came about from that immigration and, uh, in particular. But also, um, I want to freeze for a moment that, that period, especially 1821, right? We're looking at, and if we look just at 1821, we see that as the moment of Mexican independence. That's and, and when, when Spain withdraws officially. Uh, it's the year that Moses Austin uh, receives his empresario grant to settle families, uh, to Im immigrate to Texas, to, to essentially, uh, taken up by his son, Stephen Austin, after his death. It's also a time of peace treaties with various indigenous groups in the area, uh, namely, most importantly, the Com Comanche groups, who uh, in, in the 1820s and, and signed treaties with uh, with Mexican government officials, um, they didn't always last long. They were uh, many times misunderstandings by the government officials in terms of who they were signing these treaties with and what they exact, exactly they entailed. But I want to stop for a moment to think about that moment of contingency. 
Um, one, this is a, an important concept in, that historians are thinking a lot about that we don't, it, it's, so, it's so easy to read back uh, to, to, since we know how the story progresses, to think about the past in terms of what happens afterwards. But I like to think of this moment as a sort of utopian ideal, this moment when, uh, of possibility. And certainly I believe for many of the Tejanos, the Mexicans, Mexican community in Texas, uh, the, the ethnic Mexicans in, in uh, San Antonio, uh, this was, uh, they, they, were in, they felt that possibility was, uh, was available. It's, it's, uh, they, they were seeing it take place. Um, they, they wouldn't, as far as thinking about Texas as this kind of buffer zone, but beyond a buffer zone, one that it could be generative. I think Switzerland, right? Multilingual, multi-ethnic, uh, and and, uh, and where not where where no one group would have the upper hand. A kind of balance that was established uh, by enough mixture. Next slide. Um, I, I, I think, often think of uh, a painting, a series of paintings actually by, uh, by self-taught uh, military, uh, self-taught uh, soldier, William Samuel, who painted this scene of Main Plaza in 1849. Uh, Main Plaza is perhaps, is the central plaza in, in San Antonio. Uh, again, an important part of the, uh, the Spanish colonial uh, process that was a requerimiento, a set of rules and laws that literally laid out the urban plot, uh, plotted out the urban uh, grid. Uh, and, a, and a central part of that is every town was required to have a plaza. And that plaza uh, was both, it was a center in many ways. It was a public space. It was a place for commerce. It was a place for um, uh, community. It was a place, you also had s significant institutions around the plaza. In this case, uh, this, uh, th the artist painted the four sides of the plaza in a, in a series of, of paintings that you should, if you get a chance to go to the Witte Museum, uh, they're up at the Witte uh, and, and, uh, and, and are worth looking at. What, I, what you see is that, that utopian community, that moment of utopian community, although this is in 1849 uh, in the, Amer the early American period, uh, one where there was still something of a balance uh, that was possible. Now, uh, just to give a sense of of that city, uh, that the development of San Antonio de Bejar uh, in 1820, at, the, at that moment of independence, there were, was a population of around 2,000, which uh, was was not the largest uh, city in the in the frontier, but certainly it was a center uh, for uh, you know, for the it was a center for for uh, at least two days uh, travel in, each, in any direction. Uh, by 1850, in the American period, it, uh, San Antonio grows to 31,000, excuse me, 3,000. Uh, in 1880, 37,000. By 1953,000. Just to get a sense of comparison, Los Angeles in 1850 was 1,600, so about half the size of San Antonio. By 1880, Los Angeles was only, uh, was only 11,000, so a third the size of San Antonio. But Los Angeles really hits its boom uh, in 1890, 1900, and, and begins, and by 1900 is double the size of San Antonio. So in that late 19th century, San Antonio is, 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 a, is a regional city. Um, one, next slide. Uh, this is uh, one of the buildings on Main Plaza, the, what's known as the Governor's Palace. It was the, uh, the, um, the administrative building for the province of Texas. Um, it's where the governor, uh, various uh, governors or, or provincial authorities were, um, would live and, and uh, where their offices were, were uh, located. Um, I wanted to show this building for a couple of reasons. Uh, first of all, it's again still there and preserved. It was built out of adobe materials. And I think this is where I wanna start noted, noting one of the changes that takes place uh, in the 19th century. During the American period, the City Council of San Antonio banned the use of adobe uh, in, 18, in, in 1860. Uh, I have a graduate student currently writing her dissertation on this, 
and is uh, Shine Trabuco, who uh, links that uh, the, the changing demographics of San Antonio, sort of the, the, the idea of, 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 who, of, of disturbing that balance that I was uh, suggesting it was at least uh, the utopian balance that was uh, hoped for. But, uh, and, and at that point, uh, the Adobe is seen as dangerous, as uh, flammable, uh, and also, I want to. I'm going to um, suggest is seen as uh, backwards, right? As as traditional and not modern. Next slide. Uh, Behar also had one of the earliest, uh, if not the if not the earliest, public work, water systems in the in North America in 1731. They established a, a system of acequias uh, or, or uh, aqueducts uh, throughout the the uh, the uh, throughout the, the area. Next slide. These aqueducts um, were mainly um, uh, were primary were initially primarily for agricultural use through for irrigation, um, and that irrigation was based out of those. Um, um, Missions, right? So the so the missions uh, played a critical role in in developing that water infrastructure in in uh, in Bejar. I uh, those uh, aqueducts are still there. You can go visit them. The the um, I, I should note that those aqueducts were put in place 40 years before what are recognized as the first American waterworks in uh, Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, and. Uh, and, and even before any, uh, any waterworks were put in place in Boston, and by waterworks I mean public uh, water systems that were established by government, not private entities, and that were uh, maintained and, uh, and built for future use, for in perpetuity essentially, to support the po uh, population. Um, it's important to know here again they were from they were built by in, in the missions and they were this mission work was directed by those mission priests and they use indigenous labor for that uh, purpose uh, in a report from 1741 uh, regarding these uh, these public works a canary a canary islander uh, vecino or inhabitant of san antonio noted that quote the fathers used effective means to teach the indians how to use the axe and clear the lands and also how to plow and plant and irrigate the fields, how to build houses, become carpenters and tailors. And this the fathers also achieved. And with greater effort, they have taught the Indians the mysteries of, of our holy faith. Essentially, uh, they were engineers, right? The, the, this was the, 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 not only an in engineering in terms of planning the city uh, along the lines of the requerimiento and, and in order to uh, make it productive, but it was part of the, it was a significant part of the colonization process, the belief by Spanish that uh, indig the indigenous population should be Hispanicized, should be, uh, become citizens, uh, become Spaniards in becoming Catholic was one, one important in that case, but, uh, but being, but being workers was just as important, and building that infrastructure played an important role. So, um, so the so at this point, then we I'm, I'm establishing here the material base for what happens afterwards. As I mentioned in 1860, uh, the city council bans the use of adobe for construction, and uh, and. And from that point forward, you see other changes in, 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 what, in how that Mexican past is relegated. And one, I want to point to essentially, uh, the, I think, the most significant way that that past is, is, is uh, pushed into the past, and I would say into a kind of timeless past, which is through, uh, the next slide, um, I think you all know this building, right, the Alamo. Um, I, I can't see very well here, but I'm, I'm assuming most of you have been to the Alamo before, is that right? Okay. Very quickly, just shout it out. Um, what was the first thing you thought of the, when you saw it? First, first impression. It's not as big. <laughs> 
Now, I know I might be in the wrong room to ask this question about, uh, but certainly scale uh, plays a big role in how we, uh, in how we experience uh, the landscape around us. And certainly this question of the, almost 99% of the time, the, the initial reaction people have to, to being at the Alamo, sort of physically in, in, in front of it, is that it's a lot smaller than they imagined it. And so there's two parts. To, the way I think of it is it, there's two ways that this, um, uh, there's many explanations, but two that come to mind. Uh, the first, perhaps, is, is, is in the built environment. It's in a, you know, it's a, it's an 18th century building in a 20th, 20th 21st century uh, urban space, right? So that the, um, so of course it's going to be diminished in, in that regard. But I think there's another uh, context, another way that it becomes smaller, and that's that it plays this outsized role in our imagination, in our imagination of that pa of of, um, of Texas, in, in what it symbolizes, uh, and in our imagination of of that past. I want to suggest that that's by design, that the, that the Alamo has been taken out of many contexts, certainly that built environment context, uh, taken out of a historical context. And I'll point to a couple more contexts. Uh, the, if you're looking at the building, you'll see a couple things. Oh, I can even point here. Uh, you can see uh, on the sides of, of uh, first of all, I think it's important to note that this what you're seeing when you see the Alamo is a restoration. And I would say it's beyond just a restoration, it's a reconstruction uh, that removes certain elements from what, what was there before. The main one being the, 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 ca the reminders that it was a Catholic church, right? that, it was part, that it was a mission. So uh, you, you still see them there though, right? You still see the columns, the nichos, where you would have saints, uh, statues of saints on each side of the door. Uh, you, have, you have four of these pedestals. Um, there's no cross on the top, uh, which would have, I imagine was there. Those flat um, elements on the side were bell towers. So there's no bell towers that were reconstructed. It's unclear if, all, if the bell towers were ever completed. I think one of them was. Um, but certainly they were not part of that reconstruction. I have, then there's one other issue that's missing, which is who built the Alamo? Who actually put brick on top of brick, stone on top of stone, I guess it was mostly stone, and, uh, and, and, uh, and put those stones together. And, it, um, and in this case, it wasn't the Spanish priests. It, were, it, was, it was the indigenous peoples who were to live inside that mission. So essentially, the, the, the symbol of Texas freedom and liberty is a Catholic church built by indi indigenous peoples of Texas. Again, uh, absent from that expectation from when you, from how we see the Alamo. We don't see the indigenous work. We don't see that Catholic past. You see it if, you've, if you're told about it. And again, it's the telling of it that shapes how we see it. And that's that link between narrative and seeing that I want to emphasize. Next slide. Um, we know, th this is the, the reconstruction I was talking about. Uh, the, the building itself wasn't reconstructed for, until decades later. It was left, uh, as a sh it was left as a ruin. Uh, I, when I show this to my students, we talk about what ruins mean, uh, uh, how we think of they. You see time, you see weeds growing out of it, you see history, right? So essentially, it's that it's taking uh, the, that it's taking history out of time that allows a new story to be laid on top of the landscape. Next one. Um, Here's that same, uh, here's a, a 19, uh, 1900 uh, depiction of, um, of, that, of the not restored Alamo, but here you, you see the building itself as, in a, as a kind of dusty town. Nothing like the, the busy Main Street uh, scene from um, the, 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 um, the, 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 uh, 19, um, um, where was my, my, the 1949 uh, depiction of, of, of Main Plaza, right? Uh, so this, it's essentially Mexican people, that me, the Mexican uh, chapter, if you will, is put as, is in terms of prehistory. 
set in particular, in this case, against what, uh, and I think Kate's, uh, the, the, the beginning of Kate's uh, presentation here, I think really uh, comes, uh, sort of nailed what I was interested in here, which is how uh, uh, American progress and modernity, Americans bring progress and modernity, and if, and the way you show progress in modernity, uh, it, one way to show progress in modernity is to show the, uh, the sort of prehistory, pre-modern uh, peoples that have been replaced. Next. Um, but it was not, but they didn't stop there, right? Uh, uh, here we have the 1905 McArdle painting, Dawn at the Alamo, that hangs currently and, and still in the chamber of the Texas Senate. When our legislators are making their laws, they have this nice painting sitting behind them to remind them of, uh, uh, of the sacrifice of the, at the Alamo, to remind them of the, of, of the um, Mexicans coming to stab uh, Travis in the back as he's uh, nobly standing, uh, making a last stand on the wall of the Alamo. McArdle himself was Irish born, uh, was a draftsman in the Confederate Army, and then moves to San Antonio and becomes a history buff. And so, of course, he wasn't at the Alamo. Uh, it, it wasn't there to paint it, but it's that reinterpretation of the Alamo that becomes the story that we, that we know. Next slide. Um, in 1915, D.W. Griffith's film company uh, made a version of the Alamo story called Martyrs of the Alamo. Next slide. That, um, that tells the, this, essentially tells the story of the Texas Revolution as a my, as, as a version of the American Revolution, right? that the bringing, bringing liberty and freedom and uh, protecting uh, white womanhood is, uh, from uh, Mexican, uh, from the threats of, of uncontrolled, uh, dangerous Mexican men. Next slide, and the last slide. Uh, so I wanna conclude f uh, with a, s a scene from uh, what I think is one of the uh, best representations of this mo Texas moder modernity from the Centennial uh, Park murals in, uh, in Dallas, um, painted in, uh, on the Centennial of Texas uh, Independence of 1936. Um, and here you, you see exactly what I'm talking about, the, the, the association of progress, of modernity, of, 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 um, um, of the future, uh, of, of, of the future being Anglo and the past being Mexican and indigenous. Uh, so that, that Anglo future uh, figures largely in, um, in the way, 1930, in the depiction of 1836 in 1936, um, but it hasn't gone away completely. Uh, the state legislature last two years ago uh, passed a, a law and signed by the governor and, uh, to establish a, a group called the Texas, the, 18, the Texas 1836 Commission, uh, that who had the charge to um, to write a 15-page patriotic history of Texas to be handed out at the DMV to all of those who come into the to get their driver's license or, in other words, your Texas passport, I suppose. Um, and that um, that 1836 uh, pamphlet, and I know. Everyone reads everything they get at the DMV. Um, has uh, final text has come out, and this is how they describe that moment of American arrival into Spanish Mexican uh, Texas. They, they uh, Mexicanos, took a chance and invited American immigrants into the undeveloped and now nearly depopulated Texas where 300 years of indigenous, Spanish, and Mexican control had seen Tejas as full of difficulties and vexations. It, oh, excuse me, <laughs> had, whereas uh, had seen Tejas full of, uh, of difficulties and vexations, incoming Americans saw a land of boundless opportunity. Uh, that was written this month, you know, two months ago, right? Uh, so, so, th this, uh, so my question then is, uh, how do these how do these stories shape how we see the landscape? How we see these buildings? How we see evidence of the past around us in the present? Uh, I would say that's the case in looking at buildings in San Antonio, uh, these colonial buildings, these adobe buildings. But I would also say this is true of looking at uh, land, of urban landscapes driving down navigation, driving down Harrisburg, uh, 
driving down Long Point, where we see the Latino city uh, replicated in, in the Houston uh, urban fiber. Latinos, Mexicanos from Monterrey, Latinos from all over uh, Latin America, from cities in, in Central America and South America. Many come from urban spaces and, are, and, are, and, and move easily back and forth between these spaces and in, and in these uh, urban spaces in Houston. Uh, and, they, and they do this in Houston, in Monterrey, in Atlanta, moving across in buses that that continue to transect this landscape. Uh, we need to see that those landscapes as well, and, uh, and understanding that history and connecting it to the present will help us do that. Wow, that was an uh, <laughs> uh, amazing um, uh, journey uh, across this question of Texas. And um, we have a few minutes uh, for questions, and I'm going to ask a question, and then we'll open it up um, uh, to the audience. One of the things that I was reflecting on as we watched the kind of arc of the conversation tonight, um, and I think uh, Raul's um, uh, question around scene and the uh, uh, idea of how we see the city intention with how we construct narratives of the city, I think was very present in everyone's presentation. And um, as, a, as a designer in, this, in, in the te Texas conte context, I always say this, and I said it to a, the uh, French couple um, that were the artists that I uh, toured around last week as well, is that one of the things I love about being in Texas, but it's a kind of obviously a love-hate relationship in Texas, is um, that we don't, it's, you're always working in a place that doesn't quite know what it is yet. Like we don't, have a very stable idea of like the construction of the Texas identity, especially the, the Texas urban identity. And I think that was something that um, Catherine early on brought up. There hasn't been a lot of work, scholarly work on the question of the Texas identity. And as you see the, um, the range of um, both kind of methodologies and um, modes of reflection and narrative across these four um, uh, presentations, I think for me, that question of, of method or how we reflect on the status of what seems like a emergent phenomena, but also I think has been the, one of the great things in having this conversation was to say it's a emergent phenomena that's been emerging for 400 years or, or longer, um, but um, maybe requires new, new methods. And I thought it was really interesting that the arc of the conversation went from uh, the Garden of Eden uh, back to, <laughs> through different kind of materialist uh, logics or logics around consumption back to uh, a notion of a kind of utopia or a kind of political utopia, religious political utopia at the end. Um, and so I guess if I asked a question to the group, it's maybe if we could reflect a bit on that tension around methods and maybe especially methods as they relate to um, what is more commonly a kind of maybe materialist method that we see employed in understanding the streets and the, and the rivers and the infrastructure and Texas as a, a kind of material phenomena, a, a phenomena around extraction, a phenomena around um, uh, consumption um, versus maybe thinking about Texas um, through some of these more conceptual frameworks. I think uh, Michael's presentation also put a lot of these on the table um, as well as Jeffrey's in thinking about um, you know, the imagination of Texas as like of the fashion or in sort of broader uh, conversations around um, uh, paradigmatic models for urbanism. So I don't know who wants to take it or how to start. I'll start very, very quickly. And as I think this, this is a really interesting thing that I, I think the four presentations do allow us to have a conversation about, um, which I, and I think, uh, from my perspective and my interest as a historian working with practitioners does have to do with time frames. Um, and in Texas, there does seem to be uh, an urgency to always move forward, right? And this idea of progress, and that there is no past here, uh, which people repeat over and over again. And the tendency to theorize the city rather than to understand its origins or where it came from. And you can certainly theorize a place by walking its streets, taking photographs, observing it and mapping it as it is now. 
but I wonder what we lose when we when we theorize a place that we don't actually understand um, where where it came from, um, and assume actually that it didn't really necessarily come from anywhere, and that maybe it was actually random. Um, there there are many stories of Dallas and Fort Worth that say, well, it just ended up here. Uh, and so here we go, right? There's no logic, there's no reason for the city to be here. We willed it into existence in this place, which is very much a progress narrative. And I do think that there is a huge amount of really difficult history in all Texas cities and landscapes that we can theorize all we want, but if we don't actually understand the narrative that established the place that we're in, our theory is gonna, gonna be shaky. We won't have um, a good foundation to build the, the theory from. I feel like Michael has to say something. Well, maybe take it. No, I mean, I think this this is really interesting, and it's it's sort of making me think that the the method question is kind of is making me think across all of these presentations about both the city as a conceptual construct that sort of is constantly appearing and disappearing in each of our presentations and in the question you're asking, and even in the framing of the the panel in general that it's, but then it's making me think of the other things that are constantly appearing or disappearing in these histories, right? As you're talking about and as, you know, I, Raul was talking about, I think in this amazing way of the, you know, it, it's not, on the one hand, it's history and time that's appearing and disappearing constantly in the construction of a certain, you know, conceptual, category of the city, the, the city of progress and that is kind of constantly reshaping itself but can only do so by kind of obliterating the history of the past. Um, but it seems to be a particular feature maybe of these identity discussions of the city or of urbanism in Texas that there is constantly this anxiety about the appearing or disappear, the appearance or disappearance of the city itself as an ideological or a conceptual or a sort of physical category. So like I was really interested, Jeffrey, in your presentation and the idea of buildings that in and of themselves can be urbane in such a way that it's almost like they figure the city into being around themselves, right? Or of infrastructure in some of the other presentations as a kind of, you know, like what are the constituent elements that would allow one to say that the city has appeared, the city has come into existence or is maintained in its existence, you know? But it, which feels like an anxiety that maybe doesn't exist in some other places, like, you know, in New York, I can't imagine one would have to pose the question of, you know, New York is urban, right? It's sort of taken for, there are places where it's so assumed as part of the basic identity that there, this appearance, disappearance thing as part of the identity seems kind of very, very Texas in a way. I'll just, I do think that the issue of this, the rapid growth of cities post, post war is obviously, you know, that's what everyone is interested in, is, is the post war growth. They're not so interested in 19th century Fort Worth, which is just a little frontier town. And, and so the city becomes interesting on an architectural level in Texas when it becomes big um, and when it becomes something distinct and different from other places, and that's the sprawl that we see in most of the cities. And so that that's where like the history, like the 19th century history of Texas is not like, doesn't seem to be of particular interest within the realm of architecture and urbanism. And I do think that Tyler is like this interesting conundrum in that because it still has a lot of 19th century scale to it. Uh, yeah, I think uh, I would like to hear Jeffrey speak about that a bit because in talking to all of you um, before this event, uh, the question of scale as it's tied to urbanism, and actually a lot of the board, as we talked about this topic, uh, that came up. And I think um, it was a kind of lovely aspect that came up historically in Raul's piece, but in a more contemporary way um, in your work, uh, Jeffrey, around the, the notion of the urbane in a, in a, in a city that, at the size of Tyler versus like Houston, where we're sitting now. Yes. Um, I, I'm actually thinking about, I, the theme of scale came up in all the talks and the theme of material and materiality. So I also found those things very interesting. I think with Texas, um, 
I'm, I'm, and I'm thinking about what Michael just said about New York. I can't, I mean, like, it's pretty basic, but I can't get away from, like, the materiality of oil. And, um, you know, just the, the thing I wanted to say is um, what I found interesting here, I do feel there has been a shift in sort of, like, um, the focus on materiality and on materialist histories, which are slowly beginning to thread back in the sort of, um, you know, cultural, spiritual, imaginative, you know, imaginative narrative. Like, you're beginning to see more of these things come together, and I, I saw that in all the talks today. So, like, just following um, the transformation of the material, um, you know, whether it's focusing on, you know, the river and the riverbeds and how, you know, and, and the stone quarries or focusing on how the oil is transformed into money, is transformed into um, a specific kind of thing. <laughs> yes. So I, I, I'm finding all this very interesting. Um, I mean, in terms of scale, I, I'm, fast, I'm just fascinated by, you know, Tyler, um, and the relatively small scale of the city, the relatively small scale of the buildings. Um, yet, as you, as you all said, you know, this, this notion, it has this notion of urbanity. Can I, can I look, I, in thinking about materiality and the way we all talked about it actually from uh, you know, from from uh, b building the from the gravel pits in the uh, off the river to uh, Michael's personal uh, engagement to the heart bombs. I kept thinking about the heart bombs on on the on these buildings, and and what I was trying to bring up was it's ultimately people that are using this space, and it, there's a social component a com uh, that is created in an urban space, right? It's that the people are together and organizing themselves and the space is, organ is, is the way that they're doing that. Um, I think what's interesting about Texas in this case, or what, we're, what, what I was think, thinking about is, is that it's all these fresh starts, right? That it's all these new, that, that progress is, um, is, is being able to um, put that entirely aside. I mean, I grew up in San Antonio, so coming to Houston, when you could, the idea that you could take your historical buildings and put them on wheels and move them to a park downtown was radical. And, and it was about the material, the building itself, versus the context in which, you know, you can't do that with the Alamo. I mean, I'm sure they're, they're thinking about it, but that's not, um, it, the place then has a, has a different significance. I mean, a million people, more than, I mean, it's one, it's probably one of the second or third most visited historical sites in the country, right, in the, in, in the Alamo. So there is there is this need to, it, I, I think of like pilgrimage that people take to, to go visit a, a place. So place has to matter, uh, that, that, that mattering of, the, the way that place matters uh, is transmitted socially in, in some ways. I wanna see if we have a question in the audience. Sure, I can see a hand now. 
And you've, you've really seen the center of gravity for the downtown move into south, what they call South Town now, right, around the King William area. And, and um, there's a generational part of this, I think, that you're seeing in in these downtowns, uh, it, you know, in around Houston, around, uh, I see this in parts of Houston, like the Heights and other areas, where there's, uh, I don't know if it's nostalgia. I don't think it's nostalgia. I, I, I think it's a, a, a human scale that, People are, are that sort of young folks are eager to to you know inhabit and, and move around, and um, they weren't finding that in, in the suburbs. Do you want to come in on that, Catherine? I, so I do. I, I think Ford is really interesting because, like, Ford is the Texas architect that we know that loved Texas history. But the Ford's Texas history was Ford's Texas history. It's not actually Texas history, right? It was his. And so I, I do think there's this incredible need for Texas architecture, whatever that might be, which is a whole other conversation, to, like, say, okay, there's Ford's Texas history, but, like, there's a lot of other stories out there um, of how this place got to be what it is. And there is an infinite level to which we can mine the actual history of the places that we live in and design and move past Fords, Texas. And you know, it doesn't mean we have to abandon it, right? But like, like do your own like version of what Texas history really matters to you and what place history really matters to you uh, because there's a lot more out there than, than Fords, Texas. Yeah, and I mean, I like O'Neill Ford, but there's more out there. Steven, I think we can uh, maybe end with a question from you. Thank you. I'll, I'll do that really quick, just because as a historian, I usually use maps as they're published, right? So I use a 1910 survey of the Trinity River and I publish it as a 1910 map. For me, that's a really rich source and I read this archival document in a way that I find meaningful. I think most designers are like, that is a really old map. <laughs> um, and so working with my colleague um, on, in, we work with like 10 archival maps and she, looks differently at those maps than I do as a practitioner. And that's helpful to me as a historian to have someone else look at those maps in a completely different way than I do. And to challenge me not to just publish that 1910 map and say, ta-da, right? Like, I found this thing. It took a long time, right? <laughs> and I'm very excited to have found it. But as a practitioner, our conversations together are incredibly helpful in taking a 1910 map, taking a geologic survey, taking petroleum documents, taking uh, documents from the Santa Gravel Company, and trying to use them together to make an illustration that isn't just a sequence of archival images. So I do think that historians have new things to learn, and practitioners have new things to learn about the archive, and there's really room for a huge conversation there. I've been thinking a lot about this in a, in a different way, actually, um, mostly because we don't use maps like we used to uh, in terms of use. I, I do an exercise in, in my class where um, it, in order to give students a sense of perspective and space, uh, I have them all draw up just a freehand map of Houston and, and, and use those to see what they identify are the markers, the landmarks, right? The, how they, where they, usually it's you know relative to where they're going, what they need to do. Everyone has the highways, um, so 
it's, it's about experiencing space, but on the other hand, everyone, now you, you just have a, your phone telling you when to turn and where to go. And so there's, I think this um, part of how we use maps and engage maps that's uh, changing. I, wouldn't, I hate to say lost because I think it's just, it's changing. But one thing I do feel maps do in, in different ways is they give you a sense of where you are. And, and they do that because they create their own narrative. Um, when you give someone directions, you're telling a story because it has a beginning, a middle, and an end. You're starting here, you're ending there. Uh, you're, you're, you're actually filling their minds. The person you're giving the directions to, you know, you're, you're gonna take a left at the gas station, you're gonna take a right at a stop sign. They've never been to that gas station. They've never seen that particular stop sign, but they imagine it in their mind. And when they get there, they match their imagination to what they're seeing. It's, it's, it's a linear, it's a, it's a narrative that, that follows a, a linear order. And, and in that regard, it seems to me that maps tell you where you are the same way other narratives tell you who you are. It, you know, it, it's locating you uh, in a place and time. And, and so the, 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 the narratives of belonging uh, in a place are, are bound up in histories of how you got there and histories of where you're going. Thank you. Well, do you want something to say, Marco? I was, I was just gonna say on the sort of mapping question, so one of the things that's interesting to me about some of the more recent maps I showed, like the maps from more city than water um, and other you know, maps that I've been looking at is, it's in a way it seems like kind of the inverse, Stephen, of the, of the, the idea you're framing of maps as um, kind of honing in on some more less burdened or more objective reality, and it's precisely because these more recent uh, mapping practices seem to me very much to be about the opposite, that they're about uh, challenging conventional modes of cartography as a kind of objective survey through which you can do a lot of, of course, you know, valuable historical work in terms of, you know, knowing, you know, this area was not developed at this date and then it was developed in the next map at this date, right, all of that kind of stuff. But that the, the, these newer practices are trying to layer, find ways of um, layering in all of the things that in a way have been left out historically by those kinds of mapping. So I've been looking, for example, at um, this book, Petrochemical America, it's Kate Orff and um, Richard Mizrak as a photographer. But and the you know that has that talks about what Orff calls narrative cartography. So she's specifically putting those two terms together, uh, and the more city than water maps I think are very much of that type. But it's it's specifically trying to challenge conventional cartographic practices by finding ways of layering in other totalities of things in a way that may not really look like maps in the sense that we've known them, but which you know, are trying to encompass all of these other sorts of realities versus the archival or the, the kind of strictly survey mode of the map. Well, unfortunately, um, in that respect, I think, um, or in that note, I, uh, we have to um, wrap up for time. Um, I wanna say, um, uh, I, I like to tell my students, I think uh, a, a fun question for a conversation like this is a question that's like very easy to ask and very hard to answer. And I don't know um, if we've gotten to many answers tonight. I mean, the way I originally framed uh, this talk, and I think I've expressed it to some of you, was to ask, just ask the question, what is the Texas urban uh, in a way? And um, I don't know how much closer we've gotten, but I think the conversation around um, how we start to define ourselves, how we see ourselves, how we construct the narratives, how we build the maps um, that are both um, connecting the um, space under the uh, streets that we walk on to the kind of like future that we're imagining, I think is, um, is something that we um, got close to, uh, closer to a bit tonight. Um, and, uh, and I really appreciate the contributions um, from, our, from our panelists and also um, from our audience. Um, I'm gonna also wrap up by saying, um, you know, plugging that this is uh, the first event like this that we're having um, over the course of this academic year. And so please look out for our events in the spring that are gonna look at this question uh, Texas is urban um, from many different perspectives and many different um, contributors that are working on the built-in environment and thinking about the built environment. So thank you. Thank you all for coming.